Thank you. I have the great privilege of teaching at Simon's Uconnect. I am lucky enough to teach IT and music. But I'd like to start with a question. Think back to your early childhood days and what was Monday morning like for you? If you were like me, you were already calculating how long it was until Friday. <laughs> and then <laughs> out came the ruler and the pencil and the eraser, not for work, but for creating these wonderful contraptions, these inventions, and then maybe starting to continue boring that hole in the desk. <laughs> can, any, can any of you baby boomers remember the size of those holes in those old wooden desks? <laughs> Well, I suppose the modern equivalent, modern equivalence of that boredom is the twitchy thumb syndrome. Kids quickly trying to get a text off before the teacher notices. But I want to ask you another question. At Uconnect, we have a passionate interest in learning how to harness the power and the potential of virtual reality technology. So how do we take that frenetic texting and transform it from just using technology, which we know kids embrace, to kids actually making technology? How do kids get the courage and the curiosity to just not just use other people's technology, but to create their own, become creators instead of consumers, whereby they can make their own applications, have the courage to market it, maybe make a living, but most importantly, make the world a better place through it. How does that happen? How do kids become inventors instead of duplicators? Innovators instead of, uh, innovators instead of imitators? How do kids become not late adopters that blindly followed the pie piper of the mass marketing machine, but actually become enthusiastic pioneers of technology? This is a really easy question to ask, but an urgent one to answer, given global competition. It's a sobering fact to realize that by 2020, there's going to be 50 billion online devices in the world today. Unbelievable. Your network, uh, your appliances in your home will be networked. Your self-driving cars and trucks will be networked. Even your clothes will have network fabric that changes color and maybe even shape according to your mood and social context. There will be implants in your body that monitor uh, everything from your blood pressure to your blood sugar level and will be connected to your doctor's office maybe to release cancer medications. So as educators, as parents, how do you aim your students, your kids, at a target that doesn't exist yet? How do you fulfill objectives that cannot be defined? How do you launch your kids on a journey where there's no place in the map? Because the US Department of Labor estimates that within a few years, 65% of the technology that your children will be using has not even been invented yet, let alone conceived. Aiming for a target that doesn't exist. So I'd like to share with you a few lessons that we've learned on how kids can be creators instead of consumers. I want to start with a story. And it was one of those uh, revelations, aha moments, those moments of enlightenment that every teacher's career has. It was the early 90s, and I'll never forget, as already has been alluded to, the CD-ROM that came to our classroom, the multimedia PC. Oh my goodness. It was incredible. Do you remember Windows 3.1? <laughs> Woo. <laughs> and you Mac people are laughing. Copycat. <laughs> when I looked at this and got to learn it, I thought this was going to be transformative. This was going to be epical. 
This was going to lead my Monday morning kids into a pedagogical paradise. These sizzling graphics, these powerful presentations would grab their boring attention, boredom and focus it, and they were going to be lifted up to achievement that would reach the stars. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> was I wrong? Naive. And then there was Logan. Logan was a 10-year-old girl, and I've asked permission to share this. 10-year-old girl who actually transformed my teaching. Logan didn't care about my stable of pedigree CD-ROMs. She liked to write with a pen, and she liked to draw with magic markers. I was insulted. <sighs> Logan was born with a challenge. She was born with cleft lip and palate. It's a picture of her. And through her short 10 years, she had endured many invasive, painful operations and medical procedures. One day, Logan got an idea. It was more than an idea. As you will hear, it's, it was a great vision. She decided, she wondered, if I cataloged, if I wrote down all of my experiences in the hospital, put it into a book, then perhaps when other kids who are having medical problems and emergencies read it, they'll have less panic in the hospital. So she cataloged, she went through all of the operations that she had gone through and produced this, making faces. But an interesting thing happened. When she realized that she could reach a much wider audience with computers, she put down her magic markers and she embraced learning technology with much passion. And I wondered, I thought, there's a lesson here. You see, for Logan, technology was just a tool. It was just a means to a different end. It was just an instrument that she played. And when the message was urgent, she put down the violin of her magic markers and picked up the trumpet of digital publishing and created this. It was published. And right now, this book is in thousands of hospitals and clinics around the world. So that when an eight-year-old girl is clutching the hand of her mother, about to let go because she's going to be wheeled down that long, intimidating corridor into the OR to have a cancer tumor removed, she will have less anxiety because of the understanding and the education that Logan's book gave her. Incredible. And that really touched me. And I thought, wait a minute. I've been bragging about these power computers with their 50 megs of memory in their hard drive and their one gig of RAM. Maybe I have not just been putting the cart before the horse, I've been putting a 20-ton cart before a miniature dwarf Thumbelina pony. Yeah. And my thinking needed some reorientation. And it suddenly dawned on me that perhaps what I needed to be doing was not teaching all of these wonderful Photoshopping technique and programming and coding as much as making them tools to serve a higher purpose, a higher end, a higher vision. Uh, and that, that changed my life. And I'd like to uh, show you some examples of the results that it produced. A great way to get kids to be creators is to use all of the thousands of different types of Lego pieces and hook them up to an EV3 Lego brick. An EV3 Lego brick is like a mini computer that can take on sensor data, it can do all sorts of really interesting outputs. outputs. It's a controller that not only can be used by a seven-year-old student, but it can also challenge university engineering students. They actually use it in a lot of engineering faculties. It's an amazing, amazing, not really a toy, and uh, the potential for education is amazing. So. We gave our kids, got our kids to buy into a vision. Let's use this engineering to come up with a way to make transportation more efficient and effective. 
So they got to work, and my, did they get to work. We entered them in the world's largest uh, Lego competition, sorry, the largest robotic competition, the first Lego League. Over 250,000 participants worldwide last year. I've never seen motivation transformed. They put their heart and soul into this. They went to the regional competition at uh, SFU, won that. They went to the provincial competition at BCIT. They won that. And then they were given the honor for two years in a row of representing Canada at the Worlds. These little wobbly pieces of Lego. You know, I'm sure all of your kids have played with Lego. But these little pieces of Lego took these kids to Japan, to the Olympic Stadium, they took them to Atlanta, to the huge basketball stadium there, and they did really well. They came in third, one year third in the world in one of four judging categories. For myself, <laughs> wow, <laughs> for myself, I had to change my whole teaching style. I had to basically get out of the way, talk a lot less, and faci facilitate a lot more. Oh, I expanded my skill set. But I never had had a pro D on organizing potluck suppers. And I had to get up earlier Saturday morning because the kids were saying, we need to get into the school. Okay, even December 24th one year. Ooh, okay. We had, but we had such a good time, and the, the bonding with those kids and the parents uh, that, that that community uh, produced because of this higher vision was absolutely incredible. Let me give you another example. Kids got the vision of uh, doing something about the plight of Pacific salmon. They created a simulation, salmon stream simulation, Design, design a simulation that the user can create their own salmon stream. Online salmon dissector. Online salmon business builder. And again, people began to notice. They found their work reviewed in USA Today, BBC. They went down to San Francisco to get an award from the ThinkQuest. That's the, that's the president of... Um, of uh, Oracle, one of the world's largest software companies, offered our kids jobs when they graduate, to London, uh, the Royal Museum of Science, on and on and on. Then to NASA, <laughs> designing underwater robots beside astronauts that are training. <laughs> Crazy. Like, what happened? Rockets, building model airplanes, and on and on and on. And now we have at our school a most amazing collection of virtual reality hardware and software thanks to the generous donation of parents and many other donors. We've got enough for a pilot project. What are we going to do with them? Well, our kids got together. We've only had it for a few months. And uh, our kids have made incredible progress. Talked to Lori and Leanne, our science and English teacher, and, and we came up with an idea of creating a math app based on Greek mythology. And wouldn't you know it, Christian and Gerhard and Karis and Ethan, they wanted to come in over the summer. So several times they were in over the summer and they created this uh, most incredible math app, mastering a technology that is very, very difficult because virtual reality and you all have a viewer, n is not something that you just look at on a screen. It's a world that you enter. And when you put on those glasses, you can look up, you can look down, you can look sideways. You're in a, you're in a virtual bubble in a totally immersed environment. And programming in for that is exponentially more difficult than just programming for a flat screen. And our kids are on their way to mastering this technology. Where the kids are programming on for Google Cardboard, they're programming for Oculus, but the most exciting is, oh, I'm, I'm just gonna have to take a little uh, rabbit trail here. Uh, 
excuse me for being geeky, but I don't know whether you're familiar with the term texture mapping. We are going to be using a drone with two cameras, two 4K cameras. You can see them. They're above and below. They, they have eight lenses on them, and they can create this 3D bubble that we can use to put in the world so the kids can spend more time learning programming rather than doing the modeling. Sorry, I just had to throw that in. But the most ex incredible platform is HoloLens. So you can see that um, the student here is looking through, it, it's almost like big ski glasses. And what the HoloLens does is very different than what the Oculus and the cardboard does. You look through this and you see the world, the room in which you are standing. But then suddenly, holograms, crisp holograms, start to be layered. Because this technology is not immersive, it's additive. And you layer all around you with these holograms, and you can create some incredible things. Uh, a while back, a student came to me and said, Mr. Harris, I've developed an application for the HoloLens, but it's too big to fit in my basement. So last week, the three of us snuck into our gymnasium, and this space that was designed to be a basketball court suddenly was transformed into a piece of real estate that was housing nearly life-size castles that you could walk into and explore. I'll never look at our gymnasium the same again. What's in your gymnasium? In our gymnasium, we're going to have models of that you can explore of ancient Mayan civilization that Ethan made. We're going to have Viking villages that Liam made. We're going to have ancient Greek complex temples that Ben made. Because this technology is uh, unbelievable. We are so fortunate to have it. Actually, it's not available for the general public yet. We were fortunate enough to get a beta version. With this technology, any piece of spare space can become magic. Anything, any piece of spare space can be a door in which there are some very foreboding things lurking behind. This piece of spare, any piece of spare space or any mundane object can launch fairy tales. It can launch stories, it can launch movies, 3D movies of which you're a character. It can even launch trap doors. I hope there's not one under me right now. Amazing. But what happened? Think back to the childhood imagination. Think what your childhood imagination used to do to everything from dark closets to watercolor ponies. What happens to that imagination when we grow up, the adult brain. How do we recapture it? How do we recapture? Can these tools be used to recapture that imagination? Can these tools be used to transform, reinvigorate the dark, drab, rational, urban sprawls in which the majority of humanity lives? Oh, you're saying, oh, Harris, you're geeking out again like you did with those 3.1 Windows machines. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. But one thing I do know is that our kids can become creators. And they can put down the phones that they're texting and they can become creators instead of consumers if they put this new technology to serve a higher vision, to channel a higher vision. And what is that higher vision? That higher vision is to celebrate the mystery, the wonder, the joy, the sublime gift of being alive on this marvelous planet in this tiny, tiny little pocket of the Milky Way galaxy. With our existential loneliness on cold winter nights, being cured by the comforts and joys of being around wonderful fellow travelers like yourselves who care intensely, passionately for our children. Thank you.